I have uh, I have a few uh, brief preliminary things to note. Uh, the first is it's difficult to follow Professor Livingston uh, always, but I want to note to you that. Uh, Probably, I don't know what the timetable is exactly, but early next year, uh, there's going to be appearing a special issue of the Journal of Libertarian Studies, which uh, I'm honored to be uh, serve, uh, on which I'm honored to be serving as guest editor, uh, precisely on the war between the states and Reconstruction. And uh, a, a longer version of what you just heard from Professor Livingston will be appearing in there, so you should look for it because it's it's excellent. And the title, as of now, is uh, is the Confederacy morally available to libertarians? So you can use it to convert your friends and so on. So you should please watch that. Joe Stromberg is in it and a number of, uh, of great folks. Uh, so watch for that. Let's see. The second thing is I am sort of the mysterious phantom faculty member here because for some reason I don't appear in the list of faculty at the end of the handout that you got. <laughs> I assure you I am a faculty member at, at, this, at this seminar. So I had a couple people ask me, uh, you know, are you going to give us your email address? Well, congratulations, everybody. Here it is. Okay. <laughs> Woohoo. All right. If you should want to correspond with me. And please don't correspond with me in the spirit of a crank who, if I haven't returned your email in three days, denounces me in a, in a subsequent email. You know, I do have work and family responsibilities in addition to your, your email, but I'll do the best I can to get right back to you. Anyway, that's State University of New York. Okay. And the third thing is uh, our, our dean, Professor Rako, just asked me, um, are, are you some kind of a, a nihilist when it comes to dress codes? And... and, and I, in my own defense, I'm actually a rather smart dresser most of the time. When I was here last month, those of you who were on the faculty of the Rothbard Graduate Seminar will remember that you were all wearing T-shirts and short sleeve shirts and walking around with, uh, you know, cutoffs on or something. And, and I got the note from Pat Barnett uh, uh, saying that uh, this was casual dress. So I thought, okay, I'll show up with my, I won't even bring a coat or a tie, and everybody's wearing coat. You know, I just don't know. It's one of these black tie events. Do I show up in, and you show up in black tie, black tie optional, and you're the only one wearing black tie? You never know what, what you're supposed to do. Anyway, the progressive era is what we're talking about. And we talk about the progressive era, we're talking about basically the turn of the century, obviously I mean 19th and 20th centuries, until about the end of World War I. And this is the period in which we get many innovations that that uh, we've enjoyed over the years, the Federal Reserve System, the income tax. Uh, it's just, uh, you know, how could I even list them all? You should all, you should all read Murray Rothbard's book, The Case Against the Fed. Uh, I have a friend, uh, one of my best friends, works at the Federal Reserve Bank of New York. And I've never really broached the issue with him. But he came to, I had a bunch of friends stay over one night, and he saw that book on my shelf. And, that, that got the picture through to him. So basically, what I'm saying to him is, you know, if I had my way, you know, you'd be selling pencils on the street, my friend. But <laughs> anyway, anyway, the progressive era, well, as uh, Dr. Higgs noted in his opening talk, this is obviously a period of accelerating statism in, in U.S. history. And, and it's a period in which statism is given uh, a kind of an ideological and philosophical veneer. It isn't simply brute force. Uh, it, it's, uh, there's a rationale uh, uh, behind it. I'm not saying it, it's, a, it's a good one, but, but it's there. Uh, it's a, it's a so in other words, the prejudice always is toward a state solution to whatever the problem is. Likewise, there is a, a prejudice in favor of expert direction in society, that, that, that so-called value-free technocratic experts ought to be entrusted with dealing with the various problems in society. So you see, therefore, during the progressive era, a lot of uh, boards, a, a lot of uh, in the executive branch um, uh, to deal with various issues. For instance, setting railroad rates. Well, we'll have an expert board decide what the railroad rates should be. None of, the, none of them have anything to do with railroads, but we'll have them set the rates, and I'm sure that will be <coughs> really efficient. Then there is a kind of a cult. There's a cult of efficiency. Everything needs to be efficient. So, we'll, and in a sense, this follows from everything else. The state, uh, guided by experts, will give us efficient outcomes in various circumstances. And we see that in in a variety of areas in the progressive era. Uh, progressive era. This emphasis on efficiency, not only in things like scientific management, but also even there's a trend toward what's called scientific charity. 
whereby you might think, you know, giving somebody five bucks that you're doing a good deed. Oh, no. Scientific charity means, you know, we'll keep a little card on each family and say, well, you know, this one's kind of a louse or whatever. And we, we, um, we are able to channel uh, charity more, more effectively. That's not necessarily a bad thing. I'm not saying that's a bad thing. Um, the Catholic Church and the St. Vincent de Paul Society kind of took, took some of that. But I'm saying that it, it does reflect a spirit of efficiency in, in many areas of life. And even, of course, in the way government works. If the emphasis is on efficiency, well, then the, the, the U.S. Constitution isn't really your friend because the U.S. Constitution throws up all kinds of roadblocks in your way. Uh, it, uh, if you interpret it in the traditional way. So you have to stop doing that. Uh, for, for instance, uh, uh, you know, Theodore Roosevelt is a good example. Uh, I'll be returning to him several times. I, I found, going through some of his letters, a letter in which he expressly says that insofar as the Senate becomes simply an obstructionist body, and you can translate that as, inso- as much as the Senate doesn't approve the things I want, then power will pass into the hands of those willing to, uh, in, into those willing to exercise it. So in other words, efficiency is to be extended to government. So if the, if the Senate is not being efficient, if it isn't passing everything, so I being the executive, I can be more efficient. I'm just one guy. So let me do, uh, let me do the governing. So you see this cult of efficiency everywhere. And finally, this really is the, the point where, that you can you can pinpoint as really the birth of the regulatory state with, with the regulatory agencies and a ceaseless stream of, of regulations. I remember uh, Professor Hoppe had written an article uh, in the 90s, and I haven't, I haven't updated it since then, but in which he was looking at the, um, the Federal Register, the Code of Federal Regulations, and I remember it being something like, I forget how many hundreds of volumes it is, but the index of it was almost 800 pages, just the index to all the regulations. And it, I think it took up something like 27 feet of shelf space, some bizarre thing. So, you know, thank you very much, Progressive Era, for getting that particular ball rolling. Anyway, and I'm sure we'd, if, if, if even one of these regulations were removed, we'd probably all drop dead. So thank goodness <laughs> they're there. Uh, also connected to this emphasis on, on experts and science and efficiency, you can see in, for instance, trends in economic thought uh, at, that, at that time. And in a sense, this sort of pre, precedes the progressive era. But the beginnings of the American Economic Association, for instance, uh, are very revealing. And this is a point that you can see elaborated in the, in the Cost of War book in Murray Rothbard's, one of his chapters called uh, World War I is Fulfillment, Power in the Intellectuals, which it was originally published in the Journal of Libertarian Studies. An excellent, excellent chapter that once you read it, you, the whole... The whole atmosphere, the whole milieu of the progressive era will be uh, infused into your brain. It's extremely effective and extremely well done. You should all have this, uh, have this book. Uh, it's absolutely indispensable. Well, nevertheless, uh, for instance, this, in 1884, when the AEA says this, this very much sums up the, the spirit of the, of the progressive era, even though it, uh, chronologically it somewhat, somewhat precedes, precedes it. We regard the state as an educational and ethical agency whose positive aid is an indispensable condition of human progress. While we recognize the necessity of individual initiative in, individual, in industrial life, how kind of them, we hold that the doctrine of laissez-faire is unsafe in politics and unsound in morals, and that it suggests an inadequate explanation of the relations between the state and the citizens. Okay, well, that's, that's that. And as, as Rothbard points out, uh, a lot of these folks who, who got the ball rolling here saw that if they, wanted, if they were going to be able to use economics in the service of the state and have expert economists telling everybody uh, how to organize things, economics had to be emancipated from uh, a, a tradition whereby economic truths were, were attained through deduction deduction from, from axioms and premises, very much like praxeology in Austrian economics, because that always seemed to lead to free market conclusions. So we have to chuck that. Instead, we need to have a bunch of experts who go out and gather data and then just sit there and look at the data and magically theories will come out of the data or explanations will just pop up out of the data. Well, you know, anyway, I don't know how you would evaluate that, but <clears throat> I'm not necessarily in favor of, of that. But that indicates the spirit that animates this. 
Likewise, another aspect, another thing you see, when you mention the progressive era, you think about things like muckrakers, muckraking journalists who are writing articles about terrible conditions in the meatpacking plants and this sort of thing. And that is a feature as well uh, that we see. But I, I you know, I've... Uh, some of these some of these muckrakers don't really have, in my view, a whole lot of moral authority. Like Lincoln Steffens, he's going to lecture me on various problems in the country. He, here's the dolt who goes over into Soviet Russia after the Bolsheviks have taken over and comes back with his most famous, justly famous, inane remark. Uh, I have seen the future and it works. <laughs> You know, what kind of a complete idiot are you? And I'm supposed to sit there and read your articles and say, oh my gosh, American society needs to be reformed. Uh, likewise, Ida Tarbell, who writes all about Standard Oil, well, she had a family member who was driven out of business by Rockefeller. So, you know, no wonder she's a little bitter against Standard Oil. You know, she may, may have an axe to grind in this case. So, I don't know. I, I, in, my, in my opinion, these people are basically, uh, basically reprehensible. Nevertheless, uh, likewise, I, I, would just, I would add one, one more element to this mix. Uh, into this sort of statist mix, and that is the social gospel movement. And I don't, I mean, really, you shouldn't even get me started on this because I'm totally, totally <laughs> against this thing. I, I should, I should tell you, I'm a traditional uh, Latin mass Catholic type, and I have, I, I can proudly say the Catholics, there was no, and even, I can say this even with David Gordon in the room, and he knows everything, but there was no social gospel movement in the Catholic Church at, at, at this time, and nothing resembling it whatsoever. Yes, there was Rerum Novarum, but that's not at all the same thing. The social gospel movement, as most of you know, is a movement within American Protestantism that is guilty of certain innovations in, in Christian doctrine. And, and that might not sound like such a sin to you, but you know, innovation is not really the, the hallmark or the cornerstone of, of, of Christian thought. The idea is you're transmitting something that's old and you're preserving something that's old. There's nothing new about a theologian saying we ought to refer to the Bible in, in considering social problems. There's nothing new about a theologian saying we ought to be generous toward those who are less fortunate. What is new in the social gospel movement is theologians who are willing to remake Christian categories, Christian ideas, Christian mysteries, to remake them, to reinterpret them, and to give them a naturalistic meaning. So salvation. Now, the silly superstitious ones of us in the old days thought salvation meant, well, you know, you try and get your way to heaven. Oh, no, 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 no. That's sort of it. Some of the social gospel will still allow you that. But really, salvation has to be carried out in a community context. I mean, how can you really have salvation if, uh, you know, if, if housing isn't really, is sort of dilapidated? Or if you haven't figured out what the best railroad uh, fare is yet. The railroad, you don't have enough railroad regulation. How can we really say we've got salvation? So salvation takes on this, and you begin to think that Christ died so that you could get good railroad rates. You know, it's just absolute inane blasphemies like this that you see. And, and by, by no means the worst of them is Walter Rauschenbusch, who has a number of books, uh, Christianity and the Social Crisis, um, a theology for the social gospel, uh, in, in which he argues that, you know, before all these dummies got involved in Christianity, like, uh, I don't know, St. Paul, um, and, and beyond that, we had a perfectly ethical religion. It was dealing only with man's relationship to his fellow man. That's what we need to get back to. We don't need this dogmatic superstructure and things like a, you know, sin and all these other... Yeah, there's sin, but there's industrial sin and judicial <laughs> sin and collective sin. You know, anyway. I, but now, obviously, what's, what's really notable about this... So, obviously, these are people who go right along with the whole progressive program. These are people who see in the state a kind of a, a, a divine institution that can get us out of these, uh, these messes that we're in. But what's especially notable, because I did my whole dissertation on Catholics in the progressive era, is that this is a time, the progressives are generally hostile toward uh, traditional sort of dogmatic sectarian uh, religion. Uh, Catholicism, some of the uh, reformed churches th that, are, that are still... Uh, dogmatic. They, they teach Christian dogmas. The progressives are generally hostile to them. Uh, the, the New Republic magazine is very hostile to Catholicism. Sometimes it's muted, but it comes out. Uh, 
Whereas on the other hand, they have no problem with the social gospel and they welcome them in because here's a completely non-threatening religion. It doesn't threaten the state at all. In fact, this is a way of, of, uh, of getting Christianity and using it as a, as a tool to advance, uh, to advance the program. There are a million and one reasons, by the way, why they don't like uh, dogmatic and sectarian religion, but I have whole chapters on that, so we can talk about that later. I, I want to just make a brief note up here of a couple of books that you might find useful. These are books that all the faculty, they'll be yawning. They all read these books a thousand times, but I don't know. You know, I, I assume most people don't sit around thinking about the progressive era all the time, so there are a couple I, I would think of. The first one isn't really on the progressive era per se, but I still want to mention it. In fact, I know people can't really see the bottom of this board back there, so I'm going to use all the space I can get. I was recommending this book to somebody the other day, and some of the time period that's covered in this book overlaps with the progressive era, so I think it's legitimate to mention it now. Eh, you know, it's sort of silly, but it's sort of good. Uh, let's see. Uh, um, uh, 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 oh, yeah, yeah. The Myth of the Robber Barons. Uh, it's, it's got a good title, you know, because you're always being told, oh, my goodness, how could you believe what you believe? If, you know, if we didn't have the state, look at all these terrible things that would happen. We'd be getting cheap consumer goods. Yeah, what a disaster that would be. <laughs> Okay, that's one thing. This was published in the 90s, I think, by Young America's Foundation. It may still be in print. I, I think it is, but if you can check Amazon, um, it's good. It, 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 it destroys all the, the, the myths about this. And I mention this because it was during the Progressive Era, particularly 1911, when Standard Oil had an uh, antitrust suit. Was, it was suit was brought in 1906, but it didn't actually get resolved until 1911, and an American tobacco company as well. Uh, these are things that... You sh you'll see covered, uh, you see covered in here, and, and you'll get um, really what, what actually happened. Second, second thing I would note, and this is really almost kind of, I don't want to say out of date, but I think it still holds up. It's, it's everyone's favorite Marxist historian, sort of Marxist historian, uh, uh, Gabriel Kolko, The Triumph of Conservatism. Yes. Now, this doesn't mean conservatism in the sense that you're thinking. It means conservatism in the sense of protecting established interests. That's conservatism. And according to Kolko, all the reforms and regulations and, and uh, uh, all these maneuverings of the progressive era really were a sham because all they did was what you had at first was a highly competitive business environment. And, and these regulations actually were an attempt by businessmen who don't like, frankly, that competitive environment, to freeze the situation, to freeze their privileged position, to use the mechanism of the state, uh, to use regulation as a way of preserving their privileged position in the economy at that time. Now, that's quite an interesting thesis, and I actually think, I, I think this is a good book, actually. The interesting thing is that Kolko is a, you know, is a complete leftist, and um, Professor Reiko was telling me the other night that um, obviously, as, as, you would, as you'd imagine, a, a lot of our type of people would also cite his book and say, uh, you see, this whole regu regulation business is a big scam. It's just business taking advantage of people through regulation and, and hurting their competition that way and so on. Well, Kolko got wind of this, that all libertarians were citing his work, you know, free market people. And he actually said, look, stop citing me. I didn't write this for you people. Leave me alone. Well, anyway, so this is, this is something to look at. Um, Oh, and finally, there's just one more, one more, one more, and then we move on. But I think you need to have a, maybe next time we all, all the speakers could give out like a, a brief bibliography to people who want to have uh, more reading. But we all need more reading, like a hole in the head, I realize. But this is, this is a book that you can get here. Okay, I hope Lou Rockwell sees me doing this. Okay, you can buy this here at the Institute, uh, Antitrust and Monopoly. Um, the subtitle is Anatomy of a Policy Failure. So you know it's got to be a good book. It's not necessarily a book you'd read cover to cover, although maybe you would. But it, it's, it's an excellent book for, for reference because it's got all, all the key, really key cases, uh, antitrust cases, mainly in the 20th century, that, and, and you see how flimsy they all are. And, and, and these are, these are, a lot of them are things that take place uh, during, during these years. Well, another another, um, another issue I want to get to in the progressive era that isn't always always mentioned has to do with the, the growth of the presidency and the, the increase in the power of the presidency. Now, there's a brand new volume out here on the presidency that the Institute has just published. It's a huge book, 
and you really all should buy it because I, I haven't had time to look at it yet, but I, I was at the conference where the papers were given, and it's just excellent. It just busts all these myths. It's wonderful. You're going to know more than you know, 99, more than 99% of the population just by reading it. It's it's a real, real pleasure uh, to 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 own. The the um, the chapter on Theodore Roosevelt, uh, according to uh, laissez-faire books, uh, is a, quote great chapter. That was written by me, I guess, wasn't it? Yeah, it was. I, thought I, would, I don't know if you had a chance to see the last fair catalog, but I thought I'd just bring you up to date on that. Um, anyway, so I'm going to say a few things about, about Teddy Roosevelt. Uh, during, during this period, you do see the presidency growing uh, by leaps and bounds in its powers. And I'm actually going to give empirical evidence uh, for this. But first, I have a little quotation from our friend Woodrow Wilson, who, you know, President of Princeton University getting elected President of the United States. You know, need I say more? I'm an end of discussion about Woodrow Wilson. Well, he notes this in his, of course, he, he's elected for, the, for our foreign guests. Uh, he's, he's elected in 1912, serves two terms. Woodrow Wilson, in his book Constitutional Government in the United States, says this about the President. Let him once win the admiration and confidence of the country, and no other single force can withstand him. No combination of forces will easily overpower him. If he rightly interpret the national thought and boldly insist upon it, he is irresistible. And the country never feels the zest of action so much as when its president is of such insight and caliber. The presidential office, Wilson said in another passage, is anything the president has the sagacity and force to make it. Oh, Unbelievable. He's a, great, he's a great president, Woodrow Wilson. Uh, Theodore Roosevelt philosophy. Now, of course, uh, T.R. Precedes, uh, precedes Wilson. He's, he's going to take over after he was vice president of McKinley. He was assassinated. So he takes over in 1901 and then will serve an additional full term. Now, there's plenty in, in my chapter on Roosevelt, there are plenty of stories about what a crazy nut he is and he's a bizarre person and he does all kinds of weird things and everybody thinks he's crazy and Mark Twain calls him clearly insane. You know, and over and over again he does all kinds of weird things. You know, sh- yeah, anyway, I mean, I, 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 I don't want to just go look at it because I, I don't want to just read, read something that I wrote. But, but uh, Theodore Roosevelt's philosophy of the presidency stated briefly is that I, the President of the United States, have a special authority because I'm the only figure in the government everybody in the country votes for. I mean, you don't, everybody in the country doesn't vote for the senators from Massachusetts, just the Massachusetts people do. But we all, theoretically, vote for a president. So that gives the president a special authority. He is the fountainhead, in a sense, of the people. He is... The, the summit of the people. He is their, he is their representative, and he, has a, he can therefore make a claim that no other person in the government can make. So he has this theory of the executive branch and of his power in particular. Uh, moreover, he has the view, which is a kind of an inverted view of the traditional, uh, traditional view of the Constitution, that the president can do anything that is not prohibited in the Constitution. Well, that's a little bit... Gives a little latitude, doesn't it? There lot, you know, they didn't really cover every conceivable issue that, that uh, you could or could not do. So, he, and he boasts of this. He boasts of the fact that um, he expanded the authority of the office. He did things nobody else did or thought were constitutional, and he thought he was doing the country a service in doing so. And he repeats this again and again. And I think we can see, we can actually quantify this somewhat when we look at the issue of executive orders executive orders presidential directives when the president issues an order of his own accord like when the pope issues a motu proprio I guess that's sort of an obscure reference sorry whatever when when he writes his own uh, or in, in other words nothing that passes congress just the president issuing something so for instance Andrew Johnson after the war between the states pardoning people who had taken part in the so called rebellion uh, did that by executive order and that was a power that he legitimately held to issue pardons. Um, well, this is going to become very important with, with Theodore Roosevelt. It looks as though, if you look back throughout history, the first, what we would today refer to as executive orders, were actually issued under George Washington, appropriately enough, the first president. Incidentally, before going on, I would just note that I think we all may remember 
the Clinton aide who said uh, some years ago, he said, speaking of executive orders, stroke of the pen, law of the land, kind of cool. <laughs> How could you not want to punch that guy in the face? You know, I, 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 unbelievable, unbelievable. Well, George, that's right, George Washington, uh, I, I think the first, he called it a proclamation, but in our lingo we call it an executive order. In 1789, he asked the outgoing confederation government to write him a report on the state of the country. You know, okay, that was an executive order, and nobody really thought that was an abuse of, of power. Uh, and there are a few other things. By proclamation, he, he declared days of thanksgiving. But the first controversy involving executive orders seems to have taken place in 1793, when George Washington did something that seems very straightforward and not especially controversial, and that is when he declared in 1793 the neutrality of the United States in the wars of the French Revolution. Now, obviously, that is what most Americans believe. They wanted neutrality. But at that time, the president did not have the authority, strictly speaking, to declare neutrality. So at the time, believe it or not, this was considered an abuse of Washington's power to have simply of his own accord declared neutrality. What wound up happening was after the fact, Congress then later, in effect, ratified what Washington had done. And that set right away, president number one, a bad precedent is set because it means the president can issue, could do some crazy thing and the Congress will get all upset about it, but basically they'll sign off on it eventually. Ugh, I don't know if you want to be doing that. Well, you look down the history of presidential directives, executive orders, and what do you see? Well, let's say, okay, James Garfield didn't issue any. Well, he wasn't really alive that long, but he didn't issue any. Uh, Chester Arthur, I think, issued three of them. Uh, and you keep going down and you get to, and, and you keep looking at the list, zero, zero, four, zero. Uh, you get to, uh, and I think in his first term, Grover Cleveland, six. In his second term, Grover Cleveland issued 71, and doubtless that had something to do with the labor unrest, I, I'm assuming, that was taking place at that time. And then McKinley, in the late 1890s, you've got him at 51 executive orders. And then Theodore Roosevelt, 1006. <laughs> Now, obviously, there's something qualitatively different going on here. He's implementing his different philosophy of the presidency, uh, obviously. And I, you know, I wish I had, I just was reading about executive orders about six or eight months ago. I wish I'd had time to include that in, the, in, in, in there because you never hear anything about this. But that is quite a jump. Uh, in, and now, granted, he served two terms, but really, you could pretty much add up all the other ones in U.S. history and, and uh, give him a run for his money. So that is an example of the way he thinks about the office of, of, of president. Well, I have also uh, a specific example that really stunned uh, my class, and that is uh, the, the, the Roosevelt corollary to the Monroe Doctrine. Now, I'm sure a lot of you know what that is, but very quickly, the Monroe Doctrine. 1823, James Monroe, the president, uh, essentially declares... It's the policy of the United States. You know, I'm not even paraphrasing. I'm butchering this so badly. But ultimately, that we don't get involved in Europe's affairs, and we expect Europe to return the favor in our hemisphere, in our backyard. For them, we expect them not to colonize in in our backyard because that would be we would consider that a threat to our security. And at the time. The United States was really held in such contempt that no European power even bothered to respond for the Monroe Doctrine, but it was issued. Well, then, this is altogether too uh, wishy-washy for Theodore Roosevelt. His view, his corollary to the Monroe Doctrine is to say, well, suppose something is happening. He, he, issues, he, he makes this clear in 1904, and then he puts it into effect the following year. Uh, suppose you have a country that is uh, deeply in debt to some uh, European power and is unable to repay and the European power is threatening to intervene to collect that just debt. Then in order to prevent them from intervening, the U.S. should intervene first to prevent them from intervening and that would be just our updated version of the Monroe Doctrine. So we will intervene so they won't intervene and we will, we will resolve the situation and make sure that all just claims are satisfied. So for instance, this was put into effect in the case of the Dominican Republic, 1905. And the Dominican Republic, again, they're in, they're in debt. And the United States, um, Theodore Roosevelt's idea was that the United States would take over the customs houses in the Dominican Republic, collect the money, and then 
dish out some of it for debt repayment and, and, and so on. Well, when, when Roosevelt went through with this and established this agreement with the Dominican Republic, he did so and he said, the, the agreement said, this agreement will take effect February 1st, 1905. Well, the agreement was reached on January 21st, 1905. So for, for the Senate to approve this, I mean, it is in effect a, a, a treaty. Could you imagine the Senate, especially in these days, you know, transportation is slow, everything's slow. The Senate approving this in 11 days with no, he was obviously hoping to just bypass the Senate altogether. There's not enough time for them to consider uh, this, this momentous decision. He had hoped to just bypass them altogether. Well, at that time, the Senate actually cared about having a voice in anything, and they protested vigorously and said, wait a minute, wait a minute, you don't have the authority to do this. What are you, some kind of madman? You're just going to bypass the Senate altogether. So finally, reluctantly, TR had to issue it to the Senate. Okay, all right, why don't you look it over and, you know, let's get, get the ball rolling. And the Senate, there was a special session, and they, they left without actually uh, uh, passing on it one way or the other. They didn't approve it. They didn't approve it. So Roosevelt just enacted it anyway. And he said, okay, well, it's not a treaty, really. It's an executive agreement. So I don't really need your approval, as it turns out. It's funny, I didn't think of that earlier, but after you didn't approve it, I suddenly found that it's an, an executive agreement. Now, this is just a... You know, and, you don't, and you don't read about this either. You know, you don't read, I don't read that in any... I'm always looking for a good American history textbook. Never find one. You don't see that. You don't see that. We're supposed to be you know, worshipping the guy and being thrilled about him, and I, I just... I, I, won't, I won't do that. Uh, okay, well, anyway, that's an example of Theodore Roosevelt and the presidency. Uh, William Howard Taft, who was the president between uh, T.R. and Woodrow Wilson, said, it, this is very interesting, I, I didn't realize this until relatively recently, but he wrote a book in 1916, Our Chief Magistrate and His Powers. And William Howard Taft, in that book, uh, expressed alarm at this trend in the, in the uh, presidency, that you know, what force can stop him? You know, what's happening? Well, you know, maybe before you brought all those antitrust suits, you might have asked yourself that, you big jerk. But, but Taft wrote, you know, he, he was growing concerned. And Taft is, a, you know, at least a thoughtful, uh, thoughtful person. I have to note, by the way, I can't resist in mentioning TR, since I basically said everything I want to say about him before, I have a couple of additional things that I didn't, I didn't say about him in that chapter. Uh, and, and this really, in a sense, also sums up the, the whole ethos of the progressive era. Here's, here's one historian's take on, on T.R. He had only the greatest scorn for the kind of middle-class individualism and liberalism that emphasized minding one's own business, both at home and abroad. Following his death, T.R.'s death, soon after the armistice of 1918, H.L. Mencken. You don't want to get on the wrong side of H.L. Mencken's pen, <laughs> my friends. He wrote an autopsy of uh, the late president, <laughs> comparing him to Frederick the Great and the Kaiser in his love of armies and battleships, to Nietzsche. And he said this, all the fundamental objects of liberalism, of course in its classical variety, free speech, unhampered enterprise, the least possible governmental interference were abhorrent to him. In all his career, no one ever heard him make an argument for the rights of the citizen. His eloquence was always expended in expounding the duties of the citizen. Okay, well, these are things that are, that are certainly true about him. Let me take a, have a little, little drink here. Okay, let's see. There are several other points I want to make, and then I'll take, uh, take any questions. Uh, I think I'll write one more thing up here. <laughs> If you were to try to pin down the progressive movement, which you couldn't, but if you, if you wanted to get a, a good overview by somebody who was a member of the progressive movement and who, who um, could be maybe an, uh, a good example for you, it would be, well, if it were a magazine, it would be the New Republic, which, believe it or not, was, it's hard to d decide whether it was better was worse or better then than it is now. But the New Republic magazine, you, you read you read article after article, it's cheering all these developments, cheering the increase in power of the president. I mean, I've read so many articles from Old New Republics, not for fun, it was for research. <laughs> and one of the editors of the New Republic wrote the book on the progressive movement that Theodore Roosevelt read and said, you know, this is it. This is my standard that I'm going to, when he ran in his third party campaign, in effect, this is, 
more or less my program. And it was, you know, you know what? It doesn't even deserve to be written on the board. Okay, I'm just going to say what it is. Herbert Crowley wrote a book called The Promise of American Life. Don't read it unless you really can, you're able to, you're mature and, and, and settled enough to be able to, to grit your teeth through a, a real ordeal. But at the same time, it's a good primary source because it, it does sum up so much of the, the, the progressive program. The f- first thing he does in this book is to attack laissez-faire theory. This is morally reprehensible, uh, and so is Jeffersonianism. He absolutely loathes Jefferson. Uh, incidentally, so did Theodore Roosevelt, loathed Jefferson. Uh, he lo- Theodore Roosevelt loathed the Confederacy, well, because it was not nationalist. It, he wanted to break free from, from the, the nation. It didn't think that a big country was its own justification. So, so Roosevelt didn't like it. Well, neither does, neither does, uh, does Crowley. Uh, he says that, really, Jeffersonianism is unrealistic, you know, with the small scale, with the individualism, the strict construction of the Constitution. This is all really uh, not, not reasonable. And, and he compared Jefferson unfavorably to Hamilton. He said Hamilton was much the finer man and much the sounder thinker and statesman. Okay, well, anyway, that's, that's a point of view, I suppose. Uh, according to Crowley, Jeffersonianism was inimical to a good, to a sound nationalism. Nationalism is necessary to the progressive uh, reform movement, in his view. No reform can really be effective if it is not national in scope. And there is, there is beneath the surface of, of this whole movement a, a, a profound uh, distrust of and loathing for uh, a federal system. In fact, this is, this is actually a book that I would recommend on the progressive era, even though you look at the title and you think, you know, I'd rather hang upside down by, I don't know, my toenails or something and read this book, but it is not a bad book. And it really brings out a lot of themes that hardly ever are brought out, except in, except in my dissertation. Isn't that funny? Okay. What a jerk I am. Okay, let's see. This is a pretty good book. And it points out a million and one things. Uh, it, 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 and it analyzes Crowley. It goes through all these things. And, and, and it notes a lot of the, it, it makes note of and analyzes the uh, progressive hostility toward, um, toward dogmatic religion. And it's very revealing, some of these uh, arguments. Uh, it, lo- it, it, it examines the, the nationalism of the progressives. That, 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 you know, they, they, they loathe the states. They loathe local government. This is where we have corruption. Didn't you read the muckrakers? It's all corruption. Instead, on the national level, this is where you'll get your, you know, your, your more efficient and less corrupt administration, presumably. This is all brought out very well uh, in, this, in this book. And I'm told that this gentleman is somewhat sympathetic uh, to us. Well, nevertheless, um, you, go, you go through Herbert Crowley and he goes through American history and he says, look at, look at Andrew Jackson. He thought that in order to be a Democrat, you had to be anti-national. You had to smash the Bank of the United States. You had to destroy the great civil service system that we had being built up. You know, what a big jerk, what a dolt he was. Uh, according to Crowley, really, what we want to do is blend Jefferson and Hamilton. And basically, we take all the substance of Hamilton. We take, we take a little, you know, we get a carrot, a little, little bit from, from Jefferson. His idea was that he says, I favor democracy, but I don't favor the Jeffersonian brand where you've got all these little units. Because toward the end of his life, uh, you can read about this in a lot of places, Jefferson was, was positing a system in which power would be vested at the level of the ward, which is really just be a part of a, part of a city. And, and, and this is how he imagined... The, the country looking. No, 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 no. The kind of the kind of democracy that these people want is is just is is just one in which the national community is taken into account. That that's what they want. And and we give our allegiance to national elites, and we we, we remove our allegiance to to uh, local or, or or other other officials. I remember I was at a, a conference some time ago of mostly leftists. It was the E. F. Schumacher Society Decentralist Conference. And uh, I knew it was going to be bad when they opened a decentralist conference with a message from Al Gore. <laughs> what, does, what does this guy know about decentralism? Well, anyway, so with, oh, this isn't going to be any good. The one guy I liked at the whole conference was a Quaker who was a traditional Quaker. He wore the hat. He, he didn't own a telephone or a car. I, it, it broke my heart. I didn't want to ask him, well, how'd you get here? So I didn't. But... <laughs> 
but he published a you know, good magazine, and, and I liked him because he got up there and he said, you know, maybe I'm at the wrong conference, but everybody keeps saying in a, at a decentralized conference, they're using words like terms like national community. And we need, a, we need a, um, a national town hall for our national community. He said, these words make no sense together. National community? What does this mean? But this is, this is progressive jargon uh, at, its, you know, at its height. This is, it doesn't get any better than this. You know, a, a national community and so on and on. And likewise, furthermore, Crowley announces that the American state will, in effect, be making itself responsible for a morally and socially desirable distribution of wealth. <laughs> okay. 1912, there's an election, a presidential election, and you've got Taft running, the hapless Taft. Uh, you've got... Um, not a thin man, Taft. Uh, you got you got Theodore Roosevelt running and uh, on on a third party, and you got Woodrow Wilson. So this is uh, this is an election to stay home for, and you got Debs and the rest. Of it. Well, anyway, uh, in this in this election, if you actually look at it, you wonder well, what in the world separates these people. You read, you know, the historians, you read textbooks. Oh, it was a fiercely contested election. Well, it's a battle of personalities, but what the heck is the difference really between Theodore Roosevelt's new nationalism? which he models on, on, on Crowley, and, um, and, and Woodrow Wilson's new freedom. What's the big, big, big difference? I mean, you can see tiny little things, uh, change in emphasis and whatever. The, the New Republic basically supported uh, TR, but then they rather came to like Woodrow Wilson. You know, he basically did what they, what they wanted. The, the, the key issue that you always see mentioned in the textbooks is, well, here's the difference. It has to do with how did they want to deal with big business? Well... Uh, T.R. had could have matured. You know, he used to be the trust buster and so on. He, that's a little bit exaggerated, but he used to inter be interested in that. And then he sort of matured and said, well, you know, business combination per se isn't such a bad thing. Uh, perhaps it should be encouraged. It's, it's a mark of civilization. What we need to do simply is regulate businesses in the public interest. Woodrow Wilson, on the other hand, uh, you know, according to this, uh, favored was favored breaking up, breaking up large uh, conglomerations, breaking them up using the antitrust legislation, breaking them up. And that's it. That's the range of debate. So, that, so nobody says, well, you know, if they're, if they're observing property laws, why should we harass them at all? No one, basically. You look in vain. Try to find somebody who is officially arguing that. So this is the great range of debate. And as it turns out, most of the time when you read about the progressive era, Woodrow Wilson is portrayed as the laissez-faire candidate. Because, you see, what he's doing is he's restoring competition. He's taking a big, big company, and if he splits it up, then they can all compete against each other, and that's competition. Now, this is, I mean, these people, you know, historians understand nothing about economic, or these are the same historians who say that the Federal Reserve is a capitalist institution. Uh, where do you begin explaining these things? There's nothing laissez-faire about Woodrow Wilson. Uh, anyway, no, no, one, one, one barely knows where, where to begin. Uh, I, 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 would, I would note, in, in addition, that um, you should, as I, I already recommended, um, the chapter in The Cost of War about the Progressive Era that Murray Rothbard wrote. Well, in particular, notice the title of his chapter when he says, World War I as Fulfillment. Because it was sort of common for historians to say, oh, you know, the Progressive Era was going gangbusters until World War I. And then, oh, it was a disaster because they had to, it was like the Great Society in Vietnam. You know, you can't, can't do them both. But in fact, as, as Rothbard correctly points out, they, the, the progressive intellectuals, with very few exceptions, like Jane Addams and a couple others, they loved World War I. Because now, since we, we, we supposedly need a command economy, well, guess who's going to do the commanding? All these intellectuals who have nothing else to do. <laughs> so now they get to be in charge of the state apparatus. They get to put into effect all the statist schemes they've been advocating. Uh, a lot of these progressive intellectuals had, had studied in Germany. That's where you could get a PhD. They had absorbed a lot of statism uh, from there, and they were anxious to, to carry this out. And you can see the New Republic is practically gushing about the prospect and the possibilities of how we can, we can produce not for profit anymore and we can produce for use and this and that. And John Dewey uh, is going on and on about how wonderful this is. So, in fact, uh, uh, there is no incompatibility here. They loved World War I. They loved coordinating the economy. And, frankly, if you, if you look at the progressive era, what they think they're doing is bringing order to chaos. You've got a business community that's, that's, that's chaotic. We'll bring order to it. And you've got also, you've got a world 
that's chaotic. Well, we, the enlightened intellectuals, will bring order to it. So there's, there's a similarity. And a lot has been written about the fact that it's not a coincidence that the progressives also happen to be imperialists. It's the same kind of uh, nanny state uh, intervention philosophy that, that uh, exists in both cases. Uh, the Looking over all the various things that happened, and there are uh, a lot of things that one could say about the progressive era, but the New York World newspaper, looking over what had happened during the first uh, decade of the 20th century and into the second one, uh, asked this question, where will it all end? Despotism? Caesarism? Well, I think we have our answer. Okay, I'm done. I'll take questions if you'd like to throw them at me because I didn't have that much time this year.